and that white ball of light began to slowly move to the very center of the room. And as it did, it got larger and larger and larger, and then it stopped. And then the silver light began to shimmer up and down like strands of silver light in the middle of that ball, and it began to take form. And suddenly, there was my little cheerleader. So what would you do if your deceased loved one showed up and started having conversations with you? Find out on this episode of LED Live. Hey everybody, welcome back to LED Live. Today you are gonna be glad that you showed up for this show because it is a crazy story. You know, what happens when you die, I think is a big question that a lot of people have in our world. And uh, it's not every day that you meet somebody that had communications with somebody who had died in their life. And so Today we have Paul Volk with us and he has a awesome ministry. You travel around and speak in schools and churches and you travel around the world, right? About 45 countries now. That's pretty wow. amazing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm excited to jump into this and hear your testimony because this is something that personally happened to you and uh, we wanna know why or how did this all begin? Yes, well it was um, my senior year of high school and I went to a school of about 900 students. Beginning of every school year, all of us guys were walking around on our tiptoes looking over the new crop of girls that showed up over the summer. Mm -hmm. And I was heading up the north hallway and a young lady with long brown hair, bright blue eyes, a spring in her step, and a sparkle on her face. And as soon as she passed, I followed. <laughs> and so I knew she was a new girl. I didn't know where she was from, but I started asking her, but you got her in a class, you know her name, you know who she is? Finally, a friend introduced us. And I was so happy, Chris McDaniel, now I know her name. <laughs> so we got introduced and uh, I would run around the hallway to make sure I was heading in the opposite direction that I knew she had to go to for her next class. And I'd be walking down real cool. <laughs> <laughs> She'd be coming the other way. I'd say, hi, Chris. She'd say, hi, Paul. Uh, <laughs> my heart was bound. <laughs> well, after a couple of weeks, because I'm very shy by nature, I mean, God has given me holy boldness, but I'm very nice. shy. And uh, so I built up my courage and I asked her out for a date, and she said no. And I said, oh, that's okay, she's so beautiful. And uh, so a couple more weeks, I couldn't help myself, I asked her out a second time. She said no again. Uh -huh. <laughs> Three more weeks, I couldn't help myself, I asked her out a third time. And she said, no. I said, okay, strike three, you're out. Come on. You know? <laughs> Squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? Yeah. <laughs> but a couple of days later, the girl who introduced us said, hey, I hear you've been asking that Chris McDonald girl out. And I says, oh man, don't tell anybody. I'm so embarrassed, you know. I got the picture. She says, you know what you're doing wrong? What do you mean? You keep asking her for that coming weekend. Every guy on campus is asking her out. She's booked. You need to ask her farther ahead. So I ran home. I opened up my calendar, and I picked something one month away, <laughs> November 11. <laughs> Next day I went to school. I said, Chris, there's this big event going on at West High School, and I thought maybe if you weren't busy on November 11th, we could go. And she said, Yes. Uh. I was so excited. I jumped up and down. I go to her, Mickey and Sheila, and I said, you got to double it with this because I don't know what to say. I don't know how to talk. I don't, what to, I don't do all the talking. If you're there, there's four of us. Four of us can talk, and I don't have to do all the talking. <laughs> and they said, calm down, Paul. Calm down. You know, We'll double date with you. So I had one month to iron my socks, to grow nice. my pimples, to get to the <laughs> event. And the day arrived. So I was so excited. And uh, it was an all-day event. So halfway through, we went to a restaurant to go get something to eat. And as soon as I pulled into the parking lot, Mickey and Sheila jump out of the car and they begun to race to see who could get to the front door first. Well, I saw what they were doing and I said, hey, hey. So I jumped out and I started running trying to catch up to them and I realized Chris was still back at the car. <laughs> so I said, come on, Chris, hurry up. And she started running and I held out my hand and she slipped her little hand into oh. mine <laughs> and my feet didn't touch the ground mm. the rest of the day. So this was my senior year and uh, she was a sophomore and uh, so we, uh, we went to the prom together and uh, there we are at the prom. And uh, <coughs> after graduation, uh, we decided we were gonna keep a long distance relationship. I was going outside to college in Alaska, that's what we call the lower 48 outside. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we kept a long distance relationship. She said, you know, next year, uh, I'm a junior, I'm eligible to try out for cheerleading. Do you mind if I try out to cheer? And I said, why not? 
well, some guys are possessive and insecure and jealous and they don't want their girlfriends being cheerleaders. I said, no, go ahead. I mean, over 900 students, only six cheerleaders. Right. She tried mm -hmm. out and she actually made the squad. Uh, nice. I was so happy for her. And uh, so we went away to college. I'd come back Christmas time, we spend the holidays together. Then I was back off to college again. Now it was her senior year. She said, can I try out again? I said, sure, go ahead. Well, this time she not only made the squad, she became the captain, mm. our head varsity cheerleader. And we always send our head cheerleader to a camp in California where thousands of cheerleaders from all over the nations um, come to order their new uniforms, learn their new flips, their yells, their jumps, and so on. And so she was sent down there. So I came back home. She was on full scholarship now at a private university when she graduated. She was very intelligent. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> we decided um, uh, things were getting more serious and we wanted to see how we we're gonna do the future and so I had two more years to finish college and I said well why don't we finish co I finish college and then you do your last two years and uh, then we'll get married mm. and uh, I had the names of our first two kids already picked out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if it was Christopher Michael it was going to be a boy mm -hmm. Christine Michelle if it was a girl Robert James was the next boy, and then she could name all the rest. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I was home at Christmas time, and we were walking down the hallway, and we passed by the trophy case where all the banners and the awards are, and I saw this gold baton laying on the, in the case, and her name was engraved on it. And I said, Chris, wh wh what is this about? She goes, oh, it's nothing. Come on, let's go. <laughs> and I said, no, what, what, well, your name is on this. Why is that on there? She goes, it, really, it's not anything. So I grabbed one of the other students and I said, well, how come Chris's name is on this baton? And he said, well, didn't you know she went to cheerleading camp? She was our head cheerleader. I said, yeah, I knew that. Well, it was at the camp she was voted the most outstanding cheerleader in the United States. Oh, wow. wow. She never told me that because she wow. was a very humble girl. Hmm. She says, you know, we all had fun at the camp. They were just really nice to me. Mm -hmm. Come on, let's go. <laughs> so I said, yep, this is the one. This is <laughs> so I was back at college. First week in March, I get a phone call up from Alaska. And uh, she talked for a few minutes and she goes, has anybody from up here called you in the last 24 hours? And I said, well, no, I was just home for Christmas. And she said, uh, then you didn't hear about the accident. Mm. I said, mm. was anybody hurt? And she began to cry. Mm. And I said, Chris is all right, isn't she? And she said, there was a wrestling tournament last night Three of our cheerleaders rode home with one of the wrestlers. And I said, is she in the hospital? Is she in the hospital? And she said, oh, that was a drunk driver and a head-on collision. Mm. Gloria Cheryl died last night. Mm. And I'm sorry to tell you, Chris is dead. And I said, no, you got to get her to the hospital. Mm. Those doctors can do something. They can't let her go. You don't do it. Please, just, just get her to the hospital. I'll be right up. And she said, I'm sorry, Paul. All three cheerleaders died instantly in a head-on collision. So I'll never get to hold Christine Michelle in my arms. I'll mm. never get to see my Robbie boy grow up because some person decided they would drink and drive. And now you know one of the reasons I go into the high schools. Because mm. if I can help somebody else not go what I went through, these girls would not have died in vain. Mm -hmm. So they had the funeral. for I, I dropped out of college. I flew home, went to the funeral of all three girls. At the end of the funerals, my parents asked me what I wanted to do, and I said, nothing. I have no tomorrow. Right. Mm. My future is all gone. I, I don't want to do anything. And they said, well, just take the credit cards and go do what you need to do. So I flew down to, um, after the funerals were over, and went to the funeral of, of all the three girls, and uh, then I flew down to Arizona to stay with some friends. And uh, I was there for about two weeks, and suddenly I was awakened in the middle of the night. But you said nobody knew you were going except your mom? That's right. When my parents asked me where I wanted to go, and I said, Mom, I don't want any phone calls. I don't want to talk to anybody. I'm going to tell you where I'm at. Don't even tell my brother. I don't want anyone to know. And she said, you got it. She says, where are you going? I'm going to, I'm going to stay with Barb and Russ and Marie in Tucson. She goes, okay, I know where you're at. So anyway, I got down there, and after about two weeks, I was awakened in the middle of the night. And there was this pink swirling light that filled my room. Hmm. Now, Chris's casket was a pink crushed velvet casket. Hmm. The same pink color was swirling around my room. So I thought, well, maybe there's a car backing up outside. There was nothing out there. This light was in my room. It wasn't coming in my room. So I sat there for a few moments, and then suddenly in the far corner of the room, a white ball of light appeared. Well, now it got my attention. 
I rubbed my eyes and I looked again, and that white ball of light began to slowly move to the very center of the room. And as it did, it got larger and larger and larger, and then it stopped. And then the silver light began to shimmer up and down like strands of silver light in the middle of that ball, and it began to take form. And suddenly, there was my little cheerleader. Wow. I was wow. so happy. I remember walking across the cold floor in my bare feet. I put my arms around her waist. She put her arms around my neck. She kissed me here, and she said, please, don't cry anymore. I'm all right. Now, you're not doing drugs, right? No. <laughs> I was clean. Yeah. I was only 20 years old. Oh, uh, man. And so um, uh, when I had that experience, um, I sat down and I wrote a four-page letter about my feelings and my future, and I mailed it back to a friend back in Alaska. She was so touched by this letter that she took it to school, and she started sharing it with everybody, and everybody was crying, you know, reading the letter. Mm. <laughs> One of the cheerleaders saw the letter, and she started screaming hysterically, running up and down the hallways. And everybody said, Billy, what's the matter? What's the matter? And she said, it's true, it's true. I was afraid to tell anybody because you thought I was crazy, but now I know it's true. And they said, what, what, what is it? And she said, look, you guys, I came home one night and Gloria, one of the other cheerleaders, was sitting on my dresser. And when I stepped inside my bedroom, I, she said, what are you doing here? You girls are dead. And she goes, I know, but we died so suddenly in the car accident. Mm. God gave us all permission to come back to the earth to say goodbye to our loved ones. Wow. And she goes, okay, where's Gloria? She's with her fiance. And what about Chris? Where's she at? She says, well, you know, I don't know. When we were coming back to earth, Chris said she had to stop off in Arizona and she would catch up with the rest of us later. Wow. And so she was asking everybody, who's in Arizona? Who's in Arizona? Nobody's in Arizona. Who's in Arizona? Why would anybody be in Arizona? <laughs> Nobody knew. But when she saw my letter and she turned it over and she saw the postmark, Tucson, Arizona. Oh, wow. That's when she flipped out. Because she says, now I know why she told me Chris was in Arizona. Paul's there. And nobody knew I was there except my mother and Satan. Wow. So he tried to arrange all that. So a lot of supernatural things happened um, after the girls died. And everybody was just a little buzz. Everybody was sharing with everybody, you know. Satan realized he had a gold mine here. Mm -hmm. And to, to try to confuse people about what scripture has to say. So, so before, you, before you move on to that, are you, are you saying, like, you're in a public school setting. Mm -hmm. So are any of these kids, like, coming from really religious homes? Or, like, what was the, what was the, the your friends and colleagues, and was everybody now starting to talk about God? And, Actually, you know? some of them, their, their fathers were preachers in, the, in town. The, uh, Jamie Cron, her dad, uh, was the big Baptist church in town. That was her dad. And uh, Sandy's father was the preacher at a Methodist church. Hmm. And uh, they, uh, yeah. So uh, anyway, Billy uh, realized that what was going on. And she told everybody and everybody just went into, you know, ecstaticness because they said, mm -hmm. wow, they, they made it. The girls made it. Mm -hmm. They're all in heaven. And uh, <laughs> so then... Uh, Oh, when I came back home, I had a, her senior port was above my bed on the wall, and it had been there for a couple of years. When I came home, I opened up my bedroom door. That portrait had fallen off the bed, fallen off the wall, bounced on the bed, landed on the floor, and she was facing me mm. as I opened the door. Wow. And when I opened the door, I looked right at her. I didn't look at the doors, the windows, nothing. As soon as I opened the door, my eyes were right on her, and it was like she was saying, I'm here. Wow. I'm here. Mm. So... So are you saying that how long had she, how long had it been from her passing to when you saw the visitation? Uh, weeks. Weeks. Yeah. And, and when you saw that it was physical, it wasn't just like this hologram type thing, like you embraced her. No, I picked the picture up. Oh, we're not, yeah, in person. Oh yeah, she was warm. And you know, the thing about it was, she was so beautiful, I was afraid to touch her because I, I didn't know if I was going to get shocked or something. So when you hugged her, you physically felt yes. something. Oh, yeah, yeah. And did you talk? Uh, no, I didn't. Say, I was too um, overwhelmed. I mean, it was like a light bulb was on inside of her. She just radiated. She just glowed. She was so beautiful. I just, I could hardly breathe looking at her. I just was going, oh. wow. Yeah. And then. And there was no fear or anything. No, I was not afraid. No, you were just uh -uh. bedazzled. Well, I, I didn't know anything about the Bible, so I would naturally 
assume what yeah. I was experiencing was supposed to happen. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about where you were in your understanding of God or anything at this point. Well, I had a quite quite a, a potpourri. My father was a Roman Catholic, my mother a Methodist Sunday school teacher, my brother an elder in the Mormon church, wow. and I went to Baptist Bible school. So you were a mutt. Yeah, so I had a lot of churchianity, uh, you know. But if you ask any of them to find the book of Luke, they probably couldn't do it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's very common for Mormons to have visitations from dead loved ones. I yeah. hear that's like the best testimony is when oh, is it? a dead loved one tells you you're in the right church. Oh. So it's kind of common, actually. Uh huh. Well, if that was a visitation, they probably were in the right. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but anyway. A little inside uh, joke there. <laughs> yeah. So I... Uh, I uh, told my friends, I said, now listen, um, if anything happens to me and I die before um, Jesus comes, um, this is where she's buried. And I said, I, I want to be cremated and then I want my ashes put right where she is. Because mm. on that resurrection morning, I, she, I want her to be the first one that I see. Mm. And uh, so they said, we promise, Paul, we will make sure that happens. Mm. So. Uh, on that resurrection morning, I'm going to hold out my hand like that first date. Mm -hmm. and she'll slip her hand into mine, and our feet really won't touch the ground. Mm. This is her senior portrait, mm. and uh, this other one was uh, the small picture was the one I took of her for her first birthday that we had together, and uh, yeah, it was just she was just the most amazing person I'd ever met, and we had an amazing three years together uh, that we had. I never heard her complain. I never heard her make bad jokes about anybody. Every time she hear, hear us talking bad about somebody, she knew something good about them. You know, mm -hmm. they're an A student in math class. Mm. They helped us put up the posters for the pep rally. Mm. You know, she knew something good about everybody. And so you couldn't s talk too much bad about anybody because she would say, well, wait a minute, there. did you know her? You know, mm. it was amazing. Mm. So one of the things that really blessed me was uh, I always went to her high school reunions because Obviously, she was two years behind me, so I knew a lot of her classmates, and of course, they knew who I was. And uh, I went to her 10 year, her 20 year, and her 30 year. And when we got up to her 30 year reunion, Gwen, who was organizing the reunion, she said, Paul, we're going to do something special this year at this reunion. We've never done at any reunion. What are you going to do? We're going to go visit the grave sites of all three girls. Mm. I went, Oh, that could be a little tough. Hmm. And she said, I know, I know, but we've all decided on the committee that it's time that we go visit. I said, sure. And she said, I need you to do a special favor for me. And I said, what do you want me to do? She says, I want you to give an altar call to her classmates. Wow. I said, what? And she said, Paul, some of our classmates are not saved. And she said, you know, Chris was supposed to have gotten baptized the end of March. And I said, yeah, I know. And that was another little sideline story. In January of that year, she told her dad for her New Year's resolution, she says, I, I want to get baptized. Mm. And wow. he said, well, just pick a church, you know. And the church that she picked was Anchor Park Methodist. My parents were married there. My cousin was married there. My grandfather built the church, the cross that was in that church. It was our family church. That's where I went uh. to Sunday school. And of all the churches she could have picked, mm. she picked our family church. Mm. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Wait, she, did she know that or was it just a coincidence? Yeah, she didn't know. Wow. Uh, actually, one of her classmates, her dad was the, happened to be the pastor there at the time. And so she says, hey, Sandy, I want to get baptized. And she says, yeah, well, let's talk to my dad and we'll get baptized. So uh, they gone through some studies uh, for January and February. And they said, Dear, we're ready to baptize you at the end of March. But on March 6th, she took her rest in and Jesus. And you could already see the Christ-like spirit she had, you know. Yes, even before her baptism. Yeah, yeah her baptism was just a, a, a demonstration of her commitment. So anyway, I told Gwen, I said, Gwen, you know, I really don't know if I can do this. It's, it's very emotional, <laughs> as you can tell. So I, said, I prayed about it, and she said, Paul, this will be the last appeal Chris can make to her classmates. Mm. And you're her voice. Mm. You have to be her voice. And I said, you know, you're right. You're right. I'll do it. And so I bought a case of Steps to Christ. Mm. All the guys brought their guitars. <laughs> and we were singing Bridge Over Troubled Water and mm. all these songs from the 60s. Mm. And uh, this is the, the grave site uh, where she was. Mm. And uh, our school colors were red and blue. So we had everything there. And uh, then uh, Gwen nodded her head to me. And so I got up and I said, you know, the 10 year reunion was fun. We had lots of good times. 20 was great. Here we are at the 30, but there is a reunion coming mm. that is more outstanding than all the reunions we've ever been to. 
And there's a little girl down here waiting for you guys mm -hmm. on that resurrection morning. And she wants to see every one of you ready for that resurrection morning and none of us missing from the class of 1970. And so I said, I want you to make that same commitment that Jesus, that Chris did for Jesus in preparing for baptism. And I have a book here, Steps to Christ, that will help you take your steps to Christ mm -hmm. and be there for that reunion. Okay, now I have a question. So if you really believed that that was her that showed up and talked with you, at this point, where, where are you spiritually? Like, are you, are you thinking she's dead? Because you mentioned she's in the ground, but yet you mentioned earlier that she showed up. So at what point did you realize she's either dead or she really was walking around? Well, she died in 1970. 1973 is what I found out what the Bible says about it. So three years later. So three years later is when I knew. And actually, I was going to reject that teaching, saying you guys have misunderstood it, because mm. I have proof, and mm. so do a lot of other people, right. mm. that the dead are alive and mm. visiting. Mm. And so I had to struggle and make a decision between the Bible and my experience. Now, the devil knew if I chose my experience, he had me, because yeah. mm -hmm. I had no book to get me mm -hmm. through. Mm -hmm. But I decided to choose the Bible and came to the conclusion that that was a demon who actually came to visit me wow. that was wow. not her. So what verse was it that just <laughs> spoke to you? Ecclesiastes? Well, <laughs> I remember this evangelist holding up that Bible and he said, the dead know not anything. And I said, preacher, you know not anything. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> so he just kept flying through the Bible, you know. Uh, yeah. All the time when these kings died, it says, and they slept with their fathers, and they yeah. slept with their fathers. Yeah. About 30, 40 times it says that, slept with their fathers. And if you get a concordance out and you look up the word sleep, You'll be amazed. It doesn't mean snoring. Yeah. Right. It means yeah. they're awaiting for the resurrection morning. Yeah. And what clicked in my bra brain was they kept every, and everybody knows this, there's going to be a judgment day coming. Right. Everybody will tell you, is there a judgment day? Yeah, yeah. there's a judgment yeah. day coming. I said, then how do they get into heaven if the judgment's still coming? Wow. Oh, that's an interesting yeah. They haven't been judged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how can they get there? Mm -hmm. And they go, well, I, I don't know. <laughs> and I mm -hmm. said, well, maybe because. Uh, they're not there yet because nobody's there because, well, except Enoch and Elijah and mm -hmm. those who rose with Jesus on the resurrection. Mm -hmm. But uh, Also, Jesus, when he ascended, he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and when I come back, I'll take you to that place. That's right. So why would they be, be there before he's come back? Yeah. And Jesus also making the statement to the thief on the cross, saying that today you will be with me in paradise. But he didn't go to paradise that day he was uh -huh. in the grave for at least three days yeah. so that statement wouldn't make sense in the in the term of when you die all of a sudden shh, you're both up in heaven exactly but, but but his next thought dying like asleep you wake up in the morning it's like all of a sudden he's like yeah to him it per he perceived that he was in heaven that next day but literally it's the argument thousands of years that have gone by where was jesus while he was in the tomb was he really with his father but when Mary came to the tomb and it was empty, he came up behind her and she thought he was the gardener. And he said, uh, don't touch me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. This was three days after his death. He's saying, I have not ascended to the Father, yet people will look at that scripture where he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. How could that thief be with Jesus in paradise if three days later he says, I haven't even ascended to the Father yet? Yeah, it's a matter of punctuation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The way he said it was, I'm telling you today, comma, this day, while it looks like it's no good, yeah. I'm telling you today, you will, that's future tense, yeah. you will be with me in paradise. Yeah, Amen. that's yeah. awesome. Mm -hmm. it's a great I'm way telling you today, up. next week we're going to be that's hanging right. out. You know? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, we're going to the beach. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm so, heading to Florida in January. <laughs> so, yeah. so what was that like when all of a sudden you're hearing these words from the Bible mm -hmm. and you're just like, okay, who was that that showed up then yeah. and I'm... Yeah. I'm embracing this yeah. being. Feeling this love. I mean, did all of a sudden the hair go up on the back of your neck and you just realize like, oh, wow, I was just confronted with a demon. It, well, and it was painful too because I had to put away uh, the last experience we had together mm -hmm. that I thought was our last experience together. And so I had to, I had to deny that. And that, that was very hard mm -hmm. because when you're emotionally attached to something, it's hard to detach from it. Yeah. And so... Um, yeah, I came to the conclusion quite clearly. I was day and night just studying this out, looking everywhere for the loophole, you know. Yeah. And then I had non-biblical uh, friends who claimed to be Christians, and they were trying to explain it to me. And I'm going, no, that doesn't fit. That doesn't work. What about this? What about this? And they just were, they were just tying a, no a noose around their neck. Who was that in the past that 
you know, had uh, some sort of seance and then their loved one was showing up. It was like one of the inventors. It's actually a lot of them. And, and they actually knew that that person was dead, but it was the emotional roller coaster of, mm. of interacting. And he was fearful to tell his wife. Who, who was that? I don't remember which one. Um, I don't. I don't remember any of them to the to fear as uh, feared telling his wife. But there, there was Sir William Crookes, the guy that invented the radiometer, and uh, founded the element thallium. He started going to seances after his brother died. A friend is the guy that's invented the cathode ray tube. Uh, so helped invent invent television, mm. and so he he started going. Um, the same kind of situation, or maybe not exactly thomas watson who helped bell develop the telephone he went to seances every night john logie baird who also helped develop television um marconi who is no won a nobel peace prize for developing radio he was regularly going to seances mm -hmm. um let's see alexander graham bell dabbled with it but he was never really convinced like you can go to Library of Congress and lead, read letters from him to his aunt Mabel, and he's like, you know, I, you know, had these little seances all by myself, but in my room with the half hope, half fear of receiving some communication. He didn't really buy into it though. Um, uh, Marie Curie, her husband, he was really into it, but after he died, she didn't really get into that um, hardly at all. Maybe once she went after that. Uh, let's see. Yeah, there's just a lot of inventors, a lot of scientists in Victorian times that really delved heavily into With that. spiritualism. Uh, yeah. So what, what is the danger of, of believing that these beings are real? What, what, what could be a potential danger of that? Well, I think clearly that they will give you a message mm. um, that's not biblical. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, you know, I was with God. He want to make sure to, to straighten this out for you and um, that this is what is actually God meant mm -hmm. and so they can send us false messages mm -hmm. and then we end up believing a lie mm -hmm. yeah uh, I've heard near-death experiences where people are going to the light and stuff and they're like I asked the light does everybody experience this and the light said yeah and she goes even Hitler and, and the light said yeah and so when she came back or whatever she said I'm no longer afraid of death. We're all going to get to experience this. God accepts everyone, and it's love, mm. and that's all I felt. And so, yeah, it'd be very easy for someone to come back, your dead loved one, and say, God loves everyone. Everyone's going to make it here. When and you, you also have to believe what the Bible says, that, you know, the wages of sin is death. Mm. That doesn't mean that you're alive, even if you're being tortured forever, you have to to believe the Bible says when you die, you, you die, because then obviously it wouldn't be that. It would be, you know, like forever and ever, like there's the, the immortal soul. I think the, the huge key in all of this is Ecclesiastes 9.5. If you really take that scripture and slow down, it says, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know not anything. Why would the Bible say mm -hmm. the dead don't know anything? Mm -hmm. Why even mention that? Mm -hmm. right. What's the point? I right. shared Romans 6 with a uh, Assembly of God pastor, and uh, I said, you know, Romans 6, uh, the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. but the wages of sin, mm -hmm. like you said, brother, is death. And I said, eternal life is a gift mm -hmm. that God only gives to the righteous. Mm -hmm. Eternal life doesn't go to the wicked. Mm -hmm. It's a gift. Mm -hmm. And boy, did a light go on in his head, and he goes, I've known that text all my life. This mm. is the first time I understood it. Mm. Mm. And it just doesn't make sense to me um, if you think like, okay, you die and all of a sudden your soul goes to heaven when God comes on judgment day and is, is you know, resurrecting people, either his first, his second coming, right? He's resurrecting people to go up into heaven with him. Well, what about all those dead people that are supposedly going to get raised from the, from the dead? If they're in heaven, is it like, okay, everybody's got to go back down to earth and, and, and watch Jesus come and be excited about it. Yeah. You've already been up there with him. You know, that doesn't make any logical sense. Yeah, I was raised in churches that believe that. They'll say when you die, your spirit comes out of your body, goes to heaven. But it's not really that fun because you don't have a body. You don't have eyes or a tongue or anything. So... When he comes back, then you get to go back to your body. Now you get to enjoy heaven in your physical body, which is far better. There's like these verses that they even use where it says mm. it's far body, far better to have your body. But 
when you look at what happens when Christ comes back, when Adam and Eve sinned, they were separated from the tree of life. That tree mm -hmm. of life enabled them to be immortal. Mm -hmm. So when they got separated now, death is inevitable. And the Bible says that those who keep the commandments of God will have right to the tree of life. Yeah. So when he comes back, we're gonna, the righteous are going to put on immortality. We're going to get the gift of God, which is everlasting life, and have right to the tree of life. If you don't have the gift of God, which is everlasting life, and you're not going to get to put on immortality, and you're not one of those who have right to the tree of life, which How the Bible specifically says that they had God remove the tree of life lest he live forever. Yeah, be an mm -hmm. immortal sinner or whatever. Right. Yeah. And it says only God has immortality. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he's the only one who can give it because he's mm -hmm. the only one who has it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we know that, that Satan has long been preparing his final, you know, his mm -hmm. final thing that he's going to try to do. We know that he's going to blend um, spiritualism and and you know people who are who are putting their trust in their eyes instead of their trust in thus saith the word of God. Yes. That's why it's so much more important to to say I don't care what 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 is shown to me. I don't care what if I feel like this is the right thing. Yeah. You got to go back to the Bible and you got to say, but it says that the dead know not anything. I know who you are, and I'm not going to listen to you. So I've heard similar type stories um, to this before but a lot of times in those stories once people learn what the Bible says that being comes back hmm. and they're not so nice anymore Wow! did you experience that did you ever get visited by Chris again and how did that go not by Chris okay. but um, after my baptism, um, I was a life insurance agent at the time, and uh, I had way too much money for somebody my age. And uh, yeah. so uh, after I got baptized, I found out that uh, Adventists had Bible colleges. And I said, oh, great, I got to find out what a Shadrach is, because I didn't know anything. So I went to PUC, and I wanted to live in the village. So there was a, an elderly lady who rented out rooms. So. Um, she just had one room there and she rented it out to me and uh, was on the side of the house and every night I would open the window while, while I slept because it was uh, still warm enough out so I left the window wide open while I was sleeping. One night I was sound asleep. Now back up a little bit I think the reason that Satan has certain privileges with me is because I used to own three Ouija boards. Mm, oh. And so that gave him permission. When there you own go. things, you got tarot cards in your house and demonic posters and pentagrams, you better get them out because I, you give them permission. I mean, it it's even goes one step further. I mean, you listen to what John Todd said from the 70s when he worked for the music industry, specifically mm. Capitol Records and stuff. And he went, you want to know how many demons you have in your house? Go count your records. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, yes. it's not just those kind of devices. It's the movies. It's the music. It's the, you know, you got some pretty evil things in your house that's right like you said it gives the devil license to be there that's mm. right and he did and, uh, and boy after I got baptized I, I came home I put those Ouija boards in the backyard I lit a match and I ran and then they didn't burn <laughs> they no. burned <laughs> <laughs> I started heard, singing I've I, heard I'm, of I'm sure trying to burn them and, and they don't burn yeah, yeah. yeah. I've heard they go around stuff. spinning in the air and that's why I ran you know, oh, when man. I lit it. So when you did you play with them as uh, oh yes ever? yes yes we well, you had the recent three of them I mean why is not enough yeah, they were all Christmas presents. Oh, oh which is oh, crazy. Wow. Yeah, I know. <laughs> more popular. So you didn't, <laughs> popular. you didn't finish going into the, your windows open, you're going to sleep. Okay, the windows open, I'm sound asleep, uh, and then all of a sudden I feel this really cold air. It was so cold it woke me up. And I thought, man, what's that? And then I realized this was an old house, so they had big eight, ten foot ceilings in this house, mm -hmm. you know? And I, and I looked at the end of my bed, and I realized there was something darker at the end of my bed, who went clear to the ceiling. Mm. Uh, and I thought, Phew, somebody's in here, you know. And I was scared to make a sound. And so I waited for a few minutes, and all of a sudden, these giant hands, like this wide, grabbed my ankles. Mm. Oh, and my heart went into my throat. I bet. You know, and I just went, oh, he's going to take me like a rag doll and slam me against the wall. And so I waited for a few minutes. I was so scared, I couldn't even yell out for my landlady to hear me, you know. Uh -huh. And then the hands moved up to my calves. I mean, big hands like this, right around my calves. 
And I said, oh, this is it, man. <laughs> Here comes the slam, you know? And then a second later, he moved up to right below my kneecaps. And I said, all right, here we go. And finally, I didn't know what to do. And I said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I rebuke you. Mm, and he let go. Wow. Oh, wow. And nothing was in the room. Wow, Man, my heart was just pounding. Of course, I didn't get to sleep for hours. <sighs> so about a week later, same thing. A cold air comes into my bedroom. Now, I'm there studying about God and trying to learn the Bible, and mm. Satan is trying to scare me. Mm. I see what this is, all the scenario. So then the cold air comes in. I sat up and I went, oh no, but I couldn't see this black giant figure at the end of my bed. So I had a headlight on the bed, headboard, and I turned on the light. Big mistake. Mm. Mm. When I turned that light on, there was a head without a body, floating like a balloon, and it had long skin hanging down, Oof. and all this matted hair. And I was watching him go like this in front of me, mm. and I thought, anything, any second, he's gonna go whoosh, right into my face. But I just did not, I didn't even blink. I was just watching him, and he went into the closet. Mm. And I thought, well, man, I can't go to sleep with him in there. <laughs> <laughs> So I quietly wow. got out of bed. Did you watch a lot of movies as a kid? <laughs> uh, yes. Uh. But ours were sweet guys like the werewolf and dragon. Uh, <laughs> like oh they yeah. weren't demons. <laughs> yeah. I could handle those. I knew yeah. what to do with those guys. What so about now? <laughs> mistake. So I tiptoed out of bed and I grabbed my Bible. As soon as I had that in my hand, I went, oh, good, 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 good. So then I said, now, you dude. <laughs> so I opened the closet door wider. Oh, you're and brave. I, I put the Bible in front of me, you know, and I said, I know you're in here, but there's something between me and you. It's called God's shield. Amen. So I started pulling the, the hangers back. And <laughs> any second, I thought that face is going to pop out and go whoosh right into my face, you know. <laughs> but I just kept pulling the hangers back, pulling the hangers back, nothing. Mm. I went, thank you, Jesus. And for the next year or two, I would not go to sleep. Mm. without a Bible oh. within arm's reach of my hand wow. because whenever it happened mm. again I would simply open the Bible I wasn't gonna deal with them I wasn't gonna I just started reading scripture out loud, mm. out loud. Mm. even when I went camping mm -hmm. pocket in the sleeping bag pocket mm -hmm. Bible mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and if anything funny happened that thing came right out and I just started reading I didn't want to look I didn't want to feel nothing I'm just yeah. reading scripture we're done that's, That's the awesome. proper response. Amen. I don't believe that you should engage with mm. them, communicate right. with right. them. I think there's power in Jesus' name. Yeah. I mean, that we, we showed on that alien documentary that we made, you yeah. know, it's like out of all these deceptions, hundreds of accounts where people had been taken up into a spaceship and brought out of that simply by the name by using the name of Jesus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, having the word of God in your hands or knowing it or reading it. And then, you know, calling upon Jesus' name, I've heard this story over and over and over again. Those demons will flee at the name of Jesus. A friend of mine went and saw The Exorcist. Mm. And I was a brand new Christian. And that was early 1970s. 74. 74. 74. Mm. And uh, she called me up, and I, I was a brand new Adventist. And she called me up, she says, I'm going to go see The Exorcist. I said, are you crazy, girl? Uh -huh. I said, you don't go see The Exorcist. Demons can follow you home. You've mm. given them permission. And number one, there's more, uh, you know, powerful than the other one. They said the the exorcist one is oh. the worst. Didn't oh. people like faint and there was like always like these like you know people having to get have medical help from watching the movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. My I dad used doubt. to have the book in the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So she she's I'm going anyway. She says I read the book. I know what to expect. I said I'm telling you. I said don't come crying to me if something happens because I'm a new Christian. I don't I don't fool around. Mm. So she went to the exorcist. About two o'clock in the morning, phone rings. She I said hello. She goes. You gotta get over here. I said, what'd you do? She says, I told you I went to the exorcist. She says, you gotta come over here. I said, I ain't coming over there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. She says, you're a Christian, you gotta help me. And I said, I'm a baby Christian and I'm not going into battle. <laughs> <laughs> she says, come on, you gotta help me. She says, there's something outside my window. I said, I don't doubt it, it's a demon. She goes, that's not funny. <laughs> and I said, I know it's not funny. I said, I don't doubt it, it's a demon. They followed you home. She goes, oh, what am I going to do, you know? I said, but don't be saying no prayers to Mary because that ain't going to help you any. Yeah. Mm. She was a Catholic. Mm. So oh, she says, wow. hey, tell me anything. I'll tell you what we'll do. She goes, what, what, what? I says, I'll get into bed and I'll start reading the Bible out loud. You jump in the bed, you read the Bible out loud. 
and you just keep reading out loud until you go to sleep. She said, you promise me you're going to do that? I said, I promise to God I will do that. Mm. She goes, all right, all right, you promise. I said, I will. So <laughs> we hang up the phone. I jump into bed, read three verses, close the book. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't say I love God's going to read it. I just said, I was going to read it. <laughs> so Did it go away? <laughs> yep. Wow. Yeah. That's she called nice. me the next morning mm -hmm. and she says, I'm not doing any of that stuff anymore. I said, mm -hmm. listen, you don't go near that stuff. Wow. You don't go listen to any music. You don't go nothing like that. If, if you don't think it's coming from God, it's the other guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And mm -hmm. if it's not clear it's from God, then when in doubt, leave it out. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't Good care advice. if it's food, music, diet. I mean, what do you think they call it? Devil's food cake. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> I was seven years old and I was sleeping and there was a big room, three beds, my brothers, and the door was open to go to the living room. And I was awake. I was, it was very cold, and I was sweating cold. And I was like, what's going on? I was like seven, eight years old. And this voice coming from that door tell me, can I come in? Mm. And I seriously like, it was the voice, it was, uh, and a girl, I mean, not older woman or something like that. It was, you know, nice and sweet, if you want to put it that way. But they said my name, my first name is Israel. So they said, Israel, can I come in? And they asked me three times. And I was so sweating cold. I don't know if you had that feeling, sweating cold. That is terrible. And, you know, of course, you know, I was little, whatever. And I, you know, <laughs> covered myself. But I remember I used to just kind of like look it outside, right? But I never, uh, I say yes or no or whatever thing. But I had, I mean, it was not a dream or nothing. I mean, I remember, I mean, I, you know, uh -huh. and I asked my parents, like, hey, you hear this voice on them? So, no, we didn't hear anything. But uh, since, uh, I mean, we see in the Bible, you know, uh, things about demon possessing everything for children. And, you know, the, the, the enemy wants to deceive us, you know, right. wants to, I don't know. Because you're not well trained yet. Yeah. You haven't had all these years to all study the Bible. All the years to study or something like that. That's I mean. a seed planted, like, no, you know, mm -hmm. that little girl wanted to play with me or whatever. Yeah. So to you, that could be a reality. I know. Yeah. I think the devil is pulling out all the stops mm -hmm. now because yeah. I think we're on the last lap. Yes. Right? You know, like Doug Batcher said, gentlemen, I think we have entered mm. the early time of trouble. Mm. And I, I watch uh, my Daystar satellite and my Trinity Broadcasting also. And I mean, all of my Sunday brothers and sisters are saying, people, it's over, it's over. Get mm. ready, get ready, get ready. Mm. Wow. Yeah. But I want to end with an angel story if we're out yes, of time. Yes, yes, please, sir. Yes. I, I don't want them getting all the glory. I have a couple of angel stories, but one that was really amazing to me. Um, I was uh, up at Doug Cooper's house for a Christmas party. He wrote the book, Living God's Love. Mm. And at the uh, end of the party, I was coming down the hill, the mountainside, uh, and uh, I saw the road I was supposed to turn off. I was get to miss it so I, I did a no-no what you do in snow is I whipped the wheel over so I wouldn't <laughs> pass the road and the car went right into the ditch uh, a deep dish I mm. mean the the wheels were buried mm. the whole front of the car mm. and I thought I've got to run back and get a tow truck and uh, as I closed the car door this guy ran up behind me in a t-shirt and he said get in the car I'll push you out I said no, that car's not coming out it's packed in. When, when you pack in snow, it's like cement. Mm. I mean, it's not moving. I said, I'm going to have to get a tow truck. He said, just get in the car. So he digs his way to get around the front of the car. So I thought, okay, I'll humor him. So I get in the car, start it up, put it in reverse. Before I stepped on the gas pedal, the car flew out of the ditch. Oh, wow. I had to slam what? on the brake not to go to the other ditch. Oh, wow. As soon as I slammed on the brake, threw it in park, I got out, and nobody was there. Oh, wow. What? Wow. Here I was in the middle of the mountainside with deep snow, and I wanted to thank him. And I looked up and I said, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, mm. so it was, did he have a car too, or he just showed up out of nowhere? He just showed up out of nowhere. A wow. t-shirt, yeah. not he dressed just, for the snow. He, yeah, he came running up behind me and he said, get in the car, I'll push you out. Oh, wow. And I thought, this car's not going out. <laughs> and everybody always asks, what does he look like? And I don't know what happens if the Lord erases it from our memory yeah. mm. or just has a vague, but I, I can't tell you what his face looked like. White t-shirt, that's all I remember. Wow. White mm. t-shirt. And uh, he got, and he, I mean, that car was like it was airlifted, mm. you know. Yeah. And I just slammed on the brakes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and all that didn't take 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. And when I got out, there was nobody. Wow. No, nobody running down the street. Nobody. Wow. Yeah. So I just looked up and I said, thank you. 
Amen, amen. So I have a question for you. Uh, you know, you mentioned, you know, your sweet girl, you know, passed away, you know, stuff like that. Do you remarry? Uh, what happened? You love for her? You, now that you believe that she's going to be, you know, uh, the Lord's going to resurrect her, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. what, what is the plan? So what happened? You know, I, throughout college, I, I dated a couple of girls. I got proposed to a couple of times. Mm. You got proposed to. I did. Mm. <laughs> I did. And, and you, uh, you turned those down? I did. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? It, I have prayer warrior friends. Mm. And whenever something big is supposed to come up, you know, the first biggest decision of your life is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Your second business decision is your life calling. Mm -hmm. The third one is who or if you should marry. Mm -hmm. And I always mm -hmm. try to explain that when I go to the academies and stuff like that. You got three big decisions in your life. Mm -hmm. Jesus, your calling, and if or who you should marry. Because mm -hmm. the if you should marry is supposed to be the helpmate to carry out your mission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not because she's a good cook or because she's pretty or she can sing. No, it's because she's a helpmate to your ministry. Right. whatever you're called to do mm. so anyway um, it was interesting when I was in France telling this story I was in the largest Adventist church in all of France New Year, in Paris and my translator was so emotionally caught up in this story that he signaled another translator he was crying mm. and he left the pulpit and so another man come up and he finished the translation and when I got down the Parisians just they said you know, Paul, you're a Frenchman in heart. You know? <laughs> he said, you gave your little heart at 17 years old to this beautiful girl, and uh, you will never give it to another. Mm. And uh, they said, we, we believe God is saving you for her. Wow. Mm. And I said, but there's no marriage. We're given in marriage in heaven. They said, Paul, we're only in heaven for the millennium. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is a whole other topic. Yes. <laughs> We did talk a little bit about that too, and in the Bible it does talk, in Isaiah it talks about the, the little kids will play with the cobra and the snake hole and stuff, so there's going to be kids in eternity somehow, I don't know, I don't know how that all works out. Yeah, uh, I, I believe that you, when you, you get resurrected, you don't come up as an adult, you know, and there's been lots of children who have died, died in Christ. Yeah, but the children will, so will age, and there wouldn't be any children anymore at some point in time, unless we're populating again. Well, once we have immortality, we have no need to propagate. Mm -hmm. That's why the angels don't have to propagate, because mm -hmm. the angels are not going to die off. Mm -hmm. And so when if we have immortality, the need for propagating, and my understanding is that we're actually the group that replaced the fallen angels who mm -hmm. left. Mm -hmm. wow. That's my understanding. Mm -hmm. And so, um, at any rate, uh, yeah, I, I've asked the Lord, I said, if you have a helpmate for me, um, I even went on these uh, dating sites, and I've been to singles retreats. I've spoken at singles retreats, mm -hmm. and I said, Lord, if you've got some bells and whistles, I said, I know what they sound like, because when I saw Chris, boy, it was bells and whistles. <laughs> I knew immediately this was the girl. So I said, if you, if you have a help made for me, uh, but maybe I'm just not fit to be married. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so whatever the case, Lord, you can do that. And, and I, I pray when I go to places, you know, overseas or whatever, even coming down here to Tennessee, I said, Lord, you have a help made for me. You turn on the bells and whistles and I'll, I'll respond. Mm. But no bells, no whistles. I believe that's how we are supposed to actually treat anything in life, yeah. whether your job, whether, Lord, what do you want me to do? Yeah. What right. do you, how, where do you want me to go? To the right or the left? Let him direct your paths and yep. you will not be sorry for that. It won't be a mistake. So, so, Paul, thank you so much for sharing. Tell our audience if somebody out there has interacted with some supernatural event, what should they do? You know, sometimes we make mistakes by ignorance. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we make it by rebellion. But once you have been shown the light, and we have materials here that we can get to you to clarify this even more from Scripture, that you have no question in your mind. Whenever you have an encounter that's a supernatural encounter, you need to be certain if it is uh, an angelic visit or if it's from the other world. And when you start talking about Jesus, if it's an angelic visit, they're going to be with you and happy. But if it's from the other place, yeah. they start getting really upset. Yeah. And then that's when you need to clearly do what I did. And that says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I rebuke you. Amen. They Amen. have to go. Amen. That's, that's right. right. Test the spirits. Yes. That's what yep. the Bible tells us to yep. do. 
Well, thank you guys yeah. for, for checking out today's show. Thank you, Paul, for coming by. If you guys want to see more uh, content from Paul, where where do you, where can people get a hold of you or how can they get to... You know, I, I'm all over root, YouTube. I'm told I have like 50 presentations. I've never watched any of them. Nice. But from all over the world, you can brush up on your German, your Serbian, your Spanish. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I'm on YouTube and I have a website, newstartplus.org. And I don't know if you want me to give them the phone number or... Uh, we'll, we'll leave it in the description below. As long as you're not a realtor. I'm, I don't want any <laughs> realtor phone calls. <laughs> or if you're running for office, uh, don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Paul. And uh, we hope that you guys were blessed. Um, it is a crazy world out there. And as we are nearer, getting nearer and nearer to when we see Jesus coming mm -hmm. in the clouds, we don't want to be deceived. And we don't want anyone to take us off of our path. And yes. that is to literally get to the place where we can see Jesus coming in the clouds and live with him forever. So um, check this out. If, if, if you have any questions, comments, we welcome you guys to leave it below. We do take every question and comment seriously. We will respond to them. Um, and so if you have any questions about this, uh, we'll put some Bible verses in the links and descriptions to check out. But we've got a lot of other pieces of information on this exact topic as well. So thumb through some of our videos. If you're new here, we're thanking you for stopping by today. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. And uh, we hope to see you next Friday. <laughs>